speaker uh, is Xi Li. Uh, Xi Li is uh, uh, at the University of Illinois and is going to give a presentation on Pi Riverbed, a Python framework to generate synthetic riverbed topography uh, for constant width uh, meandering rivers. Hello, everyone. I assume uh, anybody can show, uh, tell me you can hear me okay? Yes. You're okay. Uh, my name is Julie, or just call me Z. Uh, I am a graduate student working with Professor Marcelo Garcia at UIUC. And today I'm going to give you a brief introduction on the Python code Pi Riverbed, which is a synthetic riverbed topography generator for constant beast manual rivers. And I will start from the motivations. So meandering is one of the most unique processes in Earth's uh, surface dynamics. Uh, if you open Google Earth or any kind of uh, similar tools, you, it, it will be very uh, quite easy to find meandering rivers like this uh, by their iconic shape. And most likely you will also uh, see the beautiful sediment bar pattern just as the left figure shows you. Uh, the figure on the right exactly reveals what we are trying to do with the present model. So the research question is, uh, can a model use river centerline coordinates uh, and give back the riverbed topography in equilibrium? Why do we need such a model? Uh, many, as you may know, many channel centerline based meandering migration models were proposed in the past 50 years and most often derived the near bank shear stress or the near bank velocity from the steady state shallow water equations in uh, the intrinsic coordinate system, and they always adopt the linear transverse slope assumption. But no one is specially designed for generating good quality bad topography. And uh, the second motivation is for myself, why, uh, what triggered the development of this model in the beginning? Uh, the answer is to create bottom boundaries for telemetric models because my main research direction is using CFD models to study meandering rivers. And we always don't have the full bathymetry data for river reaches we need to study. And in some cases, we have uh, very limited data and a good estimate of the bottom boundary can be crucial in this uh, situation because the bottom boundary is one of the six uh, phases of a control volume if we consider meandering as a dynamic system. And then let's look at some details about the model. Firstly, it has a graphical interface. There are two modes to select. The first one is generating Kinoshita curve, and the second one is uh, loading your own centerline coordinates. So if the first mode is selected, user need, uh, needs to enter Kinoshita parameters here, uh, which include uh, the number of bands, of course, and the arc wavelength, the maximum angular amplitude, the skewness coefficient, and the flatness coefficient. And if the second mode is uh, selected, a level of smoothing can be specified according to, um, based on the quality of the user pro provided centerline coordinates. And the channel width, the water depth, the channel slope, and the discretization resolution in both streamwise and the transverse uh, directions should be specified. So in the next, there are two things that need to be given. Uh, the transfer slope character and, uh, and the curvature face lag strength. These two things are the new things proposed by this study and I will discuss them later in this talk. And finally, the meander migration submodel is embedded. And if it, it is a turned on, users need to enter meander migration parameters just like other meander migration models. And the, um, the, oh, sorry. the workflow of this uh, pyrrhic bed is very clear. And please note uh, the, uh, how the time advancing uh, is coupled in the model. If the meander migration sum model is turned off, the whole workflow is going to be executed only once. And the figure on the right shows you the console output. Now let's take a look at the, the inputs and outputs of this model. So in both mode one and mode two, user, uh, users need to uh, enter channel parameters in the interface. And in uh, mode one, there is no extra input file required. And in mode two, an ASCII file containing the centerline coordinates 
uh, must be provided. And the outputs of the model include a, a result figure uh, showing the synthetic riverbed in the Cartesian XY uh, coordinate and in the S and N, which is uh, the intrinsic coordinate. And uh, the next is uh, the XYZ format point code uh, of the synthetic bed. And the next three output files, the river bank line file, the finite element mesh file, and the boundary condition file are prepared for uh, CFD modeling. And if the meander migration sub model is turned on, all kinds of files I just mentioned um, are going to be created for each snapshot during channel migration. And the final uh, GIF uh, animation file will be created to visualize the migration trajectory. Here is an example of all the output files. The first one is a point cloud, and second one is uh, the uh, finite element mesh, and the third one is a boundary condition file. If you are a Telemac user, you may have noticed the blue boundary and the green boundary are already set there, and the blue boundary always, uh, is always a flow discharge boundary in the upstream side, and the green boundary is always a water surface elevation boundary uh, in the downstream side of a channel. And the last one is a bank line file. And here is an example of the meander migration submodel. This is a Taylor band in Sabine River, uh, where is also the boundary of uh, Louisiana and Texas. Uh, in about uh, 2005, a neck cutoff occurred. You can uh, compare in the, to, uh, the Google Earth imageries uh, before and after the neck cutoff shows us the model predicts uh, reasonable bad topography. This is a model outputs. And uh, here, here's one thing I need to mention. Uh, the false colors are used to imitate the colors in Google Earth images. Because uh, the output uh, point cloud of the synthetic bed is always a VV surface. And we can always set a threshold uh, depth. And uh, the, set the color below the certain depth to dark green and set the color above the certain depth to the color of sand to visualize the sandbar. And what if we run the meander migration sub model using a straight uh, channel in the beginning, but giving a random perturbation uh, to the near bank shear stress, uh, uh, shear, sorry, the near bank shear excess velocity at the first node, which means the perturbation is from uh, the upstream side. And the lower figure is river center line migration trajectory and this uh, has been studied by quite a few studies. And the upper figure is the bad topography evolution trajectory. By applying the same idea of uh, false colors, uh, we can visualize the sandbars during the migration. And here, if we run the same setup for multiple times, again, the third and the, th uh, the first and third rows are the centerline migration trajectories, and the, the second and the fourth uh, rows are the sediment bar evolution trajectory. So after seeing a lot of uh, results of high river bed, let's go back to take a look, look at the theoretical basis. And in 1988, Stuart Beck uh, proposed an analytical solution of bed topography in equilibrium form. And its foundation is uh, linear, the linear band theory. And, uh, uh, the experiment data fitting. And the method divides here in the first equation, the method divides any cross-section profile along the channel to uh, a half, a linear half and uh, an exponential half. So this group of uh, equations tells us the bad elevation could be a function of three parameters, water depth, the channel width, and, and channel curvature. And if the, this group of equations is applied directly, for a symmetric meander band like this one, uh, the, uh, the band will be symmetric to the geometry because the, sy the symmetry C comes from the usage of uh, local curvature. And the figure on the, this, this figure uh, shows you an example uh, when this group of e equations are applied directly. So the question comes, uh, can we simply replace the local curvature with some kind of uh, cumulative curvature? And um, after a series of uh, uh, derivations uh, of a linear stability analysis, using the shallow water equations uh, as a starting point, and we can get the equation 2.40. This equation 
uh, in the end. And uh, a number of uh, studies already uh, did uh, some research on this uh, equation. And we can evaluate the right hand side uh, term by term. And the first term depends on the UB0 and C0. UB is uh, uh, the perturbation velocity at the first node. And the C is curvature at the first node. C, uh, the C is the curvature and zero is the first node. Uh, so these are the initial conditions. Uh, the example on the previous page uh, just show, showed you the, uh, the UB0. When UB0 is a temporal variant non-zero, what will happen? And the second term, this term, the A3 term, uh, implies the near bank access velocity is negative proportional to the local curvature because chi here is uh, um, the sinuosity to the power of minus one third. The sinuosity is uh, a, a number between one to two or three, but uh, then chi is larger than zero leads to A3 is minus, uh, is um, below zero. The third term, the convolution integral, is equivalent to imposing a phase lag to the local curvature. And A4, the last parameter, wraps score factor A, friction coefficient CF0, uh, half width to depth ratio beta, and the zeros order uh, from number F0 and uh, the semiosity to the power of uh, uh, minus one third into it. And here in Beck's equation, the score factor A has a relationship with beta, which is a uh, uh, aspect ratio divided by two. And then we can reduce the number uh, of depending parameters of A4 from five to four. Then, but this relationship of A is found too high when the beta is uh, high. So, uh, which brings the motivation to put a character in front of the formula to reduce or adjust the, um, to uh, determine the magnitude of the transfer slope. Uh, the final formula is uh, in the next page. So here now we work on replacing uh, convolution integral of the local curvature C. We can write the convolution integral as a fancy F here, and we can write another um, corresponding upstream word weighted moving average of uh, the local curvature C as the fancy G. And the macro effect of G is same as the F. It's just imposing a phase lag to the local curvature. Note that the, the Moving average also a type of convolution uh, in math, right? Uh, now you may ask a question from F, F to G, what if the amplitude and the phase shift changed? Here is a solution provided in this model. And in the interface, there are two model inputs uh, to control the amplitude and the phase amount, phase shift amount. And they should work like uh, calibration parameters. Um, then the final formula of transfer slope is uh, showing in this equation, the 2.45. So um, and I can summarize uh, what I have done in one this uh, paragraph uh, in this graph. Um, the black line is local curvature, and the red dash line is uh, lagged curvature. It can be uh, the convolution integral or the moving average. So in this study, we chose uh, moving average because it's easy to control the phase. And here the implementation. Uh, we all know Python is a lot slower than C or Fortran uh, in sense of computing, but we have Numba to make the Python code fast. And for the interface, I chose the standard Python interface, uh, which requires no extra installations uh, for the users. And the code is uh, hosted on GitHub. And why the final uh, thing is uh, why it makes a final element mesh and a boundary condition file. So the major motivation uh, of making the finite element mesh and the boundary condition file right after the production of uh, the synthetic bed is to offer a convenient follow-up step to perform CFD models. So here I am showing you a uh, workflow of uh, and river modeling could be. So the Riff, Map, and Paris, which are two softwares or packages uh, already uh, published and they can uh, trans, uh, they can uh, extract the river centerline coordinates from uh, satellite images, the, the Landsat images, and uh, the Pi River bed with the centerline uh, coordinates and give you the bed topography, and you can use the bed topography in the following uh, CFD models. Here, I'm not sure, going to, sorry for my uh, interruption, but could you wrap up in the interest of time? Yeah, I'm not going to read everything here in the okay. uh, features. Yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation, Xi.
Um, before we move on, can we have maybe one short question? And if there's no question, I, I can, I have one more question, um, she, because I, I find the meandering rivers really fascinating and, and maybe you touched upon this and I missed it, but I can imagine that the different grain sizes in the riverbed can have a, a, a big impact on the riverbed topography. Uh, can you maybe touch upon how your model is dealing with that or if your model can deal with that? Uh, because this is an analytical solution, so it's assuming, so based on the channel width, depth, and the slope, that's just only three parameters. So it's assuming the channel forming, uh, because there's no discharge there, and there's no information of sediment there, and it's, so, it's assuming it's a sand bed river, and it, the, channel, uh, the discharge is a channel forming flow. So it's not recommended to use this uh, model for your uh, experiment. The, flume studies because uh, uh, the discharge can you can vary the discharge and you can change the transverse slope by your own uh, so it's not uh, controlled by the channel forming uh, discharge so that's uh, my answer so it it's, it's it cannot uh, capture the effect of different green sizes but you can uh, play with the calibration parameters and you can play with a little bit to uh, uh, captured the uh, real transverse slope. Wonderful, thank you.